We started some weeks ago looking at various denominational churches. I pause here and say in the midst of this study, we certainly have no ill will or anything personally against anybody in those particular churches. It is our desire to set forth the truth of God's Word and cause all men everywhere to sit down and compare and contrast what they believe with whatever church they're part of beliefs. That's all we can do and it comes to our life on earth. Think for a moment. If you did not have a Bible, what would you do? Well, you'd either just be some nature worshiper or something that didn't even believe in God, or you would be involved with some of the pagan religions, such as Hindus or Muslims, things like that. And so we ask all everywhere to truly consider what they believe. And as we go through examining denominations, they are public institutions. They're there for your examination, even as the church of Christ is. And I think it would be a foolish thing on the part of anybody claiming to approach God through Jesus Christ not to examine every one of them in the light of what the Bible teaches. I think it's a sad thing when people can be a part of such groups knowing there's only one God and one Savior, Jesus Christ, and one Bible knowing of the prayer for unity that Christ prayed that all would be one even as he and his father are one, knowing of the swift rebuke Paul made to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.10, and encouraged them by inspiration to be of one mind and one judgment. They all speak the same thing. And yet here are people who say, well, God's our Father and we love Him and Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He's the only Savior and the Bible's the Word of God. We all just flutter every direction and not believing the same thing. Why? Well, today I want to talk with you about the Methodist Church. It's the church of my father's family. And so I certainly have no ill will toward that. I tried to study with my grandmother while she was still alive. And she finally told me, she says, quote, David, I'm just not going to see it your way, unquote. And of course, she doesn't really realize what she confessed when she says, I'm not going to see it your way. That tends to imply that the Bible speaks different things to different people. And they're so you're sincere, you do the best you can, and God will accept it. Well, I didn't bother her anymore after that, and she was just as dear to me as anybody could be, and we always had the same relationship. But I'm not going to push the truth off on anybody that doesn't want it. You hope times will change, and attitudes will change, and they'll be receptive to the pure word of God, and be honest with themselves and with God, and evaluate their lives in the light of God's Word because it's going to judge us on the last day and it will really mean then what it reads means now, John 12, 48. Understanding that the Methodist Church, unlike others of the Protestant Reformation, did not form out of the Catholic Church, but it formed actually out of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. <clears throat> it was then about 1729 and I think virtually all the books would say that. Uh, John and Charles Wesley, brothers, thought that the Church of England was being too formal and cold, and they thought it ought to be livened up. And uh, so they began to do that kind of thing. Uh, most of the time nowadays, and for many years, you don't think of the Pentecostal-type actions done in the Methodist Church. But they were very much that way, even up until the turn into the 20th century. As my grandmother told me, she said, Methodists used to be known as shouting Methodist because they would have Pentecostal uh, actions, and that was part of what Wesley and both brothers thought about the matter. I think it's interesting that this is uh, noted, I believe, in, uh, I believe it's in Earl West's book, The Sanctuary Order, uh, Search for the Sanctuary. 
Search for the Ancient Order, Volume 1. He says, England's famed old Oxford University has been called the cradle of lost causes. But at least one cause was born there which was not lost. This was Methodism. In 1729, the Oxford Methodist, and in parenthesis, also dubbed the Bible bigots, Bible moths, M-O-T-H-S, and the Holy Club, uh, uh, closed parenthesis, were a tiny group of students who gave a stated time to prayer and Bible reading. Prominent among them were John Charles Wesley and George Whitefield. If you are around Methodist much, you'll see somewhere where they have churches called, uh, something about it called Whitefield. Um, they were, he says, methodically religious. Now, we won't go into all about their history, but nevertheless, that's how it started. And the only way you can learn something about a church is by going to read wherever it puts its doctrine. And you have a Methodist discipline. Now, this is something that must be put down for every denomination today. To some, it would be applicable far more than it would be others, but it's impacted all of them. And that is that modernism has had its impact and that you can't always know exactly what they're doing right now and what they believe, as you could at one time. Many years ago, if you want to know what the Methodists believe, you get their Methodist discipline, and it tells you. But nowadays, you don't know about all of that, but this is how we will try to, to look at it. The attitudes that they have toward the Bible would make us think that they would want to take the Bible and the Bible only. They say the Holy Scriptures contain all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein nor may be proven thereby is not to be required as an article of faith or thought to be required or necessary to salvation. Well, they're not even found in the Scriptures. So why are they necessary for salvation? But they have a Methodist discipline. So in view of the fact that the Methodist people affirm that the Scriptures contain all necessaries, uh, all that's necessary to salvation, then why do they cling to a man-made document like the Methodist discipline? Or even if they don't all go by it, why do they still say this is the way we will be? This is a hard thing to understand by people who admit that their true source book is the Bible. Why not just stay with it? Let's look for a moment at what they teach concerning sin. They subscribe to the doctrine of what's called original sin. And uh, they say that exists not in following Adam, but it's the corruption of man's nature. They say that original sin is engendered of the offspring of Adam, that man is of his own nature inclined to evil continually. They furthermore believe that man cannot turn and prepare himself to believe and obey God. Here again, that gets into the fact that back originally, they would have direct operations of the Holy Spirit, better felt than told stuff and all of that. Of course, these statements reflect two major doctrines to which most of the religious world subscribes. Total hereditary depravity and the direct operation of the third person of Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Neither of those is true. Nevertheless, it's found in the doctrines of men and embraced by most denominations. I know and you know that a man can suffer the consequences of another man's sin but we don't suffer the guilt of it. You can be the right, most righteous person on earth if you run over and killed by a drunk and that's suffering the consequences of his sin, but I'm not responsible for his sin. Because sin is the transgression of God's law. Not something we inherit. 1 John 3 and verse 4. If sin is inherited, the son will receive his sin from his father. But the scripture says in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. Again, that's Ezekiel 18, verse 20. 
the Bible, God's Word, teaches that man is active in his salvation. Not passive. When I say active, it means that we submit to God's will. That's called obedience, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. He must, that is we must, in becoming Christians, repent and turn, Acts 3.19. And that's a essential if one would be saved. So to be considered also is the fact that if sin is inherited, the son then would inherit the sins of the father. Since this is the case, and since Adam is called the son of God, Luke 3.38, I think you can see that it follows that Adam would have received his sin from God his father. Well, shall we belittle that any more than it belittles itself? I don't think so. It's ridiculous to think that. Yet these great thinkers in denominationalism who embrace Calvinism have to hold that view. In other words, that's the implication or consequences of the doctrine. Well, they wouldn't admit that, yet their doctrine implies it. When we come to salvation by faith or justification by faith, according to the Methodist discipline, then one is saved, as most denominations teach, by faith alone. Now, no one should be surprised at this belief, simply because every way you turn, that's what people have been taught for hundreds of years. As it said in the Methodist discipline, wherefore, that we are justified by faith only, is a most wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort. But they've already admitted the Bible is the rule of faith and practice, the only rule of faith and practice. And if it's not found in that, it shouldn't be anywhere. Well, you can't find salvation by faith only anywhere in the Bible. I have in debate pointed out to people when we were debating this subject, now we can save a lot of time for me to say right at the very beginning that I accept every passage in the New Testament says we're saved by faith, that we're justified by faith. You don't have to bring them all up here. It's a waste of time for you to do it. What you need to bring up here is the passage that says we're saved by faith only. And then, of course, you look at James 2.24, and it does say faith and only in the same verse, but it says we're not saved by faith only, and that's the only passage where you couple the two together. And that's ungetoverable. And so why people continue to say, oh, we're saved by faith only, and that it's a wholesome doctrine and very full of comfort, when it's not even taught in the Bible, is beyond me. Listen to Romans 5.1. Being therefore justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But the way that a denominational person reads that is this way. Being therefore justified by faith only, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly the way they read it because that's what they've been taught. But it doesn't say that. The words are not there. The Holy Spirit did not inspire Paul to write that. And this is only one of many. As I've said, James 2.24 makes it clear that we're not saved by faith only. What is their view of regeneration? Every person that becomes a Christian must be regenerated. You cannot be saved from your sins and become a Christian without being regenerated. Well, the Methodist people believe and teach that baptism is a sign, a sign of regeneration or the new birth. And this means that one has been saved or regenerated and that baptism is indicative of salvation that has already occurred at the point of faith only. But notice that the Bible teaches that baptism is in order to salvation, not because one is saved at the point of belief only. According to the New Testament, no person was ever regenerated, then baptized. If you look at John 3, 3, and especially verse 5, you'll see that baptism is a part of the new birth. Regeneration translates palingenesia, which means plain, again, Genesis birth. The new birth and regeneration refer to the same event. Regeneration stresses the inception of a new state of things 
in contrast with the old. So Vine says in his expository dictionary of New Testament words. Let me read this. The word is found but twice in all the oracles of God. Once in Matthew 19 verse 28 and once in Titus chapter 3 verse 5. In the former it is almost universally understood to mean a new state of things. Not a person's. A peculiar era in which all things are to be made new. By quote bath of regeneration unquote is not meant the first, second or third act but the last act of regeneration, which completes the whole and is therefore used to denote the new birth, being born of water in the Savior style and the bath of regeneration in the Apostle style. In the judgment of all writers and critics of eminence, refer to one and the same act, and that is baptism. Paul writing to Titus in chapter 3 and verse 5 affirms that we have not been saved by works which we have done. Again, this is a stumbling block to the people who cannot see that there are other works other than meritorious works. They don't understand that when you're active, then you are doing something, and that's work. But all the time you're active doesn't mean that those actions are trying to merit your salvation. They can be simply, and those that pertain to salvation are, Showing forth your faith in Christ by taking him at his word and complying with his will. Thus is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. So there's all confusion when it comes to just exactly what regeneration is and when it takes place and how it happens. Man cooperates in his regeneration. It's a must. It's essential. You can't be a Christian and not be regenerated. But it's in obeying Christ that form of doctrine, from the heart. Well, what is the heart? It's the inward man. It's the real you. It's the seat of your intellect and rational being. It has to do with where your conscience is. It has to do with your emotions. It has to do with your will. All of that must be in harmony with the teaching of the Scriptures regarding regeneration that you might be converted. The whole must be changed. You can't say intellectually, well, I know what the Bible says on what I must do to be saved, and that saves you. Because you may turn around and say, with your will, I'm not going to do what I know the Bible says. And there are people that have done that. Well, you haven't been regenerated. You can know the truth of Christ. But if you don't bring your whole heart into submission to the Lord, it won't do you any good. It's made plain in Romans 6, 17, and 18, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Now notice, you have obeyed from the heart. And that's all the heart. You have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching. What was it? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6, 3, and 4, Colossians 2, 12. And when you did that, you became free from sin, a servant of righteousness. Notice you weren't, but you become, and when do you become? It's when you're regenerated. When were you regenerated? When you were buried with Christ in baptism. That's the form of doctrine. It wasn't before, and it wasn't after. Of course, the Methodist people believe that baptism of children is not only uh, to be retained in the church, but that Adults and parents of children should have the choice of whether they sprinkle water on them, pour water on them, or they immerse them. Since they're taught that it doesn't make any difference, I don't even know why they even should consider immersion or why they should consider just pouring something on them. If you've got a choice, just sprinkle a little water at me. That's fine with me. But you don't have that choice if you do what the Bible says, and the way the Bible says it, for the reason the Bible says it. Baptism, baptizo in the Greek, means to dip or to plunge. That's why it's called a burial. There was a Methodist young man in my freshman year of college, and uh, we were trying to visit with him. And I pointed out to them, you don't bury people in the graveyard. Their bodies, like you do, those that would become members of the Methodist church, 
I said, all you do is sprinkle a little water on them. I said, what at the graveyard? He said, go bury these folks. And I went out there and just sprinkled a little dirt on top of them. Wouldn't they be buried? Well, no, they wouldn't. But he had to try to say, well, the Indians buried their folks. And they put them up on a, on a scaffold. I said, they didn't bury them then, did they? <laughs> but in his mind, just wherever you put the dead person, however you put him, he's buried. Well, that's not necessarily so. But that's the way people think. Even though the Bible's clear, you can't get clearer than a burial. And they won't let that same definition they use when it comes to baptism be applied to any other kind of burial. But that shows you to what ends people will go and just how blinded people are to the simple, plain teaching of the Bible. When you do something for years and years and years and everybody says that's all right and they take it for granted and everybody around you says that's all right and then you have to question it. Well, that gets hard for some people. I read an article yesterday and it was printed probably close to 50 years ago, somewhere back there. And it was about a woman who was up in her 70s in very bad health. And she had started going to worship services with members of the church. And she just continued to go. She come from, came from the typical denominational mindset, one church good as another. But as she continued to go, she heard things she'd never heard before. And after all those years, even though before she was baptized, people would ask her, well, where do you go to church? And she'd say, Church of Christ. So they took note of that and began to work with her more and ask her questions and take time with her. And uh, she says, I think I want to be baptized. And they said, well, we need to go over some things and make sure you understand that repentance must precede baptism. You've got to be sure you're going in the right direction. So they went over a number of things again, and she thought about it, so the article stated. And she said to them before she was baptized, she said, do you mean I've got to give up all this stuff I've been taught was right ever since I was 10 years old? Here she is, 77 years old. And they said, well, you give up whatever's not taught in the Bible. Whatever you're doing that was taught in the Bible, keep on doing it. But yes, on those things you mentioned, which is typical denominationalism. And she arose and was baptized. Well, that may be few and far between because the older we get, the more, as the fellow said, get, we get sot in our ways. <laughs> but folks, it doesn't make any difference at what age you are. The truth is the truth is the truth. And how one is regenerated is clear. If a person reaches a stage where they can't be taught, and if they're taught they can't understand, and they can't repent, and they can't confess their faith in Christ, because it has been formed, they don't understand. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. They don't obey the gospel. There's nothing you can do about it. Man must be willing to comply with God's will in order to be saved from his sins. That's how you show your faith in God, in Christ, in the gospel system. There is no other way to do that. So we don't have a choice when it comes to baptism. God's already set it out for us. Our choice is to take it or leave it. Man doesn't have a choice where God is already regulated. There are literally dozens of reasons why infants are not proper subjects of baptism. Now, I suppose the most conspicuous ones being the lack of accountability and the incapability of them believing and repenting of sins. Luke 13, 3, Acts 17, 30, and Mark 16, 16, Acts 2, 38, and many others. Concerning the Methodists, and I'll not be able to touch on all of them here, there is uh, the teaching of the Methodist that man cannot prepare himself by his own strength to have faith and comply with God's will or call upon God as you please. Man has no power to do good works, they say. Well, that was strange because when Ananias, who was chosen by the Lord as a gospel preacher, was sent to Saul of Tarsus. And Saul knew that he would hear what he needed to do to be saved when he got to that place, a street called Straight. The Ananias told him that in his road on the way to forgiveness of sins, that he was at the point where he needed to arise, be baptized, wash away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22:16. 16. 
Well, how can you look at that and then take this view that Methodists do concerning there's nothing you can do in order to be saved? And yet most of them do. Most denominations do. And of course, if you're a pure Calvinist, this position actually demands the direct operation of the Holy Spirit of God for the purpose of regeneration. And that in some way or the other enables a person to respond in further obedience per their doctrine. And again, I say most denominations hold that particular view. Now, I pause here again to emphasize that in the intervening years since, well, I'll say since World War II, there's all sorts of views that I wouldn't begin to say that I know all of them when it comes to the denominations. They've been influenced so much by modernism and simply secularism that they don't hold to their creeds and catechisms and manuals and prayer books like they once did. So they are able to have about anything going on and you just about have to question people to, uh, <clears throat> to know specifically what they do believe. But I know this, the New Testament of Christ unequivocally affirms the ability of a man to respond to the gospel. Not only is this taught in the Acts of Apostles and the letters of the New Testament, but even the parables Jesus used in his earthly ministry, such as Luke 8, makes that very clear. Well, nowadays I want to close on this point. Really, I just uh, made it, so I'll refer to it again. I don't know what all denominations really believe today. They have removed themselves so much from a strict adherence even to their own manuals and prayer books. You don't know what really is going on. And they may not even abide by that which makes them, according to their view, what they're supposed to be. Because we've had such a rejection of truth as being absolute and objective and to embrace subjective relativity and to just do everything because of a false concept of grace and love that people don't really have much in the way of rules to follow. It's just not there. In fact, any church nowadays that says you must follow these rules is pretty well sneered at and kicked at even by many of its own members. So you can expect to find about anything that's in the world among the Methodist people and a lot of other denominations. It should be understood from the first to the last that when we compare the teachings of men with the teaching of the Bible, we're not putting the Bible on trial. We are not attempting to harmonize the Bible with human doctrines. What we are doing is taking the Bible, God's Word, and reconciling what men believe with what the Bible teaches. First Thessalonians 5.21 still says, Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. We have to do that. You come telling me, well, God teaches in the Bible for you to do this or not to do that. Well, that's when you need to open your Bible and show me. And that's what people don't care to do and don't like to do and don't do it. And I'm sad to say even in the Lord's church, we're further away from that than we used to ever be. And that's why we have trouble in the church. I want to bring this out. It ought to have been brought out at the very beginning. I think you know it, but I want it stated. The church of Christ is not derived its history from the Protestant Reformation in Europe. We have nothing to do with it. We haven't been started by any one human being. We just simply go by the Bible. Now, people like to say, well, you were started by Alexander Campbell. When they say that, they know little to nothing about what went on 200 years ago. They don't understand the seed principle that when you take the seed of the kingdom and you teach it and people hear it and obey it, what are they going to become? Moonites? Well, when you obey the seed of the kingdom, you become a citizen of the kingdom. You become a, a Christian. If not, then whatever human taught you, whatever it is you believe, then you have to be their follower. That's not the case. And all you have to do is look in the book of Acts 
and see people teach the same word, sow the same seed of the kingdom, and wherever it germinated in the hearts of men, they understood it, they adhered to it, they obeyed it, they were regenerated in being baptized into Christ, and they were Christians under the one head, Jesus Christ, following all the New Testament of Christ and living like it said and worshiping like it said. That's Christianity. And if you make any more out of it than that, then you turn into a man-made religion. So let's keep in mind that to be a Christian is really a very simple thing. It's to understand the gospel of Christ through the study of the New Testament. To believe it and to comply with the terms of entrance into the kingdom, to be regenerated, to be born anew by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Him, and being buried with the Lord in baptism. When, you ra when you're raised to walk in the newness of life, you're regenerated, you're a new creature. Then you seek out others who have believed and done the same thing from the heart. And you work with them. And as far as any organization, you sit out in the New Testament how the church is to be organized. That's all New Testament Christianity is. There's no hierarchy. There's no big palaver and carrying on. Even look at the worship, by as simple as it gets. But have you ever noticed that it demands from each individual who truly engages in every act of worship or in doing the things we're to do and being ready unto every good work, it demands consecration and dedication and a humble attitude toward God and His Word. It demands being convicted with the truth, converted truly to Christ, that from the heart you're busy doing what he wants you to do as the New Testament guides you. That's Christianity. Just think of all these people out here just in the United States who call on God as their Father, Christ as their Savior, and the Bible is the Word of God. If they would just lay aside all these things that cannot be found in the New Testament and just simply comply with the terms of pardon set out 2,000 years ago when the church was just the church. 1,500 years before there was... Protestant Reformation. Just be Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Members of the church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood. How simple the plea is, and yet how rejected it is. If you're not a child of God, we've studied what to do to become one. We urge you to do that because you don't know when you're going to leave this world, and that's too late. As a child of God, are you holy as we discussed this morning? Are you living your life in harmony with the New Testament? If you've sinned, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject then to the Lord's invitation, we bid you come while we stand and while we sing.